It's going to be good. It's going to be good. All right, kids, you can take off. Listen to your teacher. Learn a lot. Be good. Well, welcome to Impact Church, and good morning, everybody. So good to see all of your faces this morning. Uh, if you're watching online, we welcome you. We're glad that you're with us. You know, sometimes just things happen, and you're not physically able to come to church, or, you know, God forbid something happens, you, you know, a car accident or something, and you're just held up, and, and it's nice that even when we can't get to church, we can't make it, at least we still have a way to watch virtually, you know. So uh, we're thankful for those who are watching online. Uh, well, good morning. I hope you've had a good week. Uh, I know I had a really good time. I think the other adults had a good time last week at, at Ignite when we dressed up as celebrities and did Holy Land Squares. It was awesome. Uh, guys, did we have a good time? Yeah. Like, that, was, that was so much fun. We've got to do that again. I think the adults had fun, the kids had fun, and hopefully they learned a lot of trivia about the Bible, we will do that again. That was a, that was a winner. I did. I had fun. Yes. <laughs> that was awesome. All right. Well, for our sharing our faith moment, you know, we, we try to be mindful of, hey, guys, we need to be sharing our faith out there, right? Uh, I'm, I'm going to give you this tool. We haven't been, we haven't talked about it in a while. It's called Bless. Okay. If you want to try to reach people who are far from God, who don't know Jesus yet, let's use this Bless strategy. All right. First of all, B, begin with prayer. All right, start praying for, hey, God, who are you trying to send me to? And open up some doors and show me the faces. Show me some names of people that you want me to go try to reach. L is for listen. Not talk. Listen. Listen to people and their stories and their struggles. Actively listen so you can get to know them. E stands for eat. The guy who invented this says you cannot skip this one. You must eat with people or get coffee. Why with people? Why? Because it builds relationship. It just does. When you sit around a table, you eat with somebody, get coffee, it builds a relationship. Well, once you've been doing all these things and you've been listening to them and you've been eating with them, then you learn how you can S, serve them, right? You're going to hear different things that they're going through, different struggles and say, hey, you know, I heard them say this and I could, I could help with that, right? You start serving them. You show that you really care about them. And then that leads to the ultimate, to the final S, which is share. Share your story. Share God's story. What has God done in your life? Can you share? Do you have a testimony to share? Anybody got a testimony to share here of what God's done in your life? Anybody at all? I think we got some testimonies in this room. Share your testimony. Testimonies are meant to be shared. Or share the gospel. Share God's story of, what, uh, of Jesus. You know, the, the story of how people can be saved. So let's, let's try to be mindful of bless uh, this week and look for who we can bless, okay? Be on the lookout, all right? Well, let's get into our message this morning, and I want you to start off. Some of you may have to turn behind you. Uh, I was going to say, turn to the person next to you. Maybe there's someone behind you that you can turn to and just say, good morning, brother, or good morning, sister. Just go ahead and greet them, all right? We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are. So how many of you grew up and you had siblings growing up? You had a brother or a sister or multiple siblings. Okay, so when I was growing up, uh, when I was growing up, I had an older brother. He's about three and a half years older than me. And I had a younger sister, have a younger sister. And so what does that make me? The middle child. And some of you are going, oh, that explains so much <laughs> about Jeremy. Now we know he's a middle child. No. Um, but... My brother, when, when I was a little kid, we lived in, in some apartment complexes. And in the apartment, uh, there was this giant dirt pile that somebody had dropped in there. And some kids, you know, you know how it is in apartments. You have all these kids riding around on their bikes. They form sort of a bike gang, right? And, and all of a sudden, they're all jumping off of, they've turned this dirt ramp uh, into a ramp, right? They're going off the ramp. My brother's going off the ramp on his bike. Well, then he, he, I'm just watching, and he turns and looks at me, and he's like, do you want to give it a try? I'm like, okay, you know, I want to be like my brother. So I'm like, do, 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 pedal up the ramp, go off, and I landed all wrong. I mean, all kinds of wrong, and I just, I hurt my stomach, I hurt my leg, and I'm crying. I'm like, oh, man, I'm like, I'm like six years old, you know, and I'm crying. I'm like, oh, Barry, it hurts. My brother's name Barry. Barry, it hurts, it hurts. And he's like, are you okay? Are you okay? And he's walking with me, and he's like, 
calm down, calm down. You know, and you know, you already know, he's not so worried about as much if I'm okay. He's worried about what? If my parents find out. If I get hurt and it was on him, right? So I, I finally calmed down. And he's like, all right, now don't tell mom and dad, okay? Right? Any of your siblings ever said that? Don't tell mom and dad because they know they're going to be in big trouble. So um, who, is, who is better? Uh, how many of you growing up had sibling rivalries like who's better who who mom and dad likes better or who's better at sports or who's better at academics yeah you got some sibling rivalries going on there right some some competition you know we had some sibling rivalries but uh, even though we competed uh, I will say my brother my sister they both we cared about each other and they really did try to help me like my brother he was older than me and I looked up to him and he helped me with fashion. Like if he saw me, if my brother saw me wearing some like frumpy clothes, I'm like, no, 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 you're not, you're not going to school in that. He, he would hook me up. He'd be like, here, here's a shirt that doesn't fit me anymore. This is a nice shirt. You go, you go to school in style, right? He helped me out like, like that. My sister, she helped me out with girls. She, she taught me how not to talk to girls, how, you know, where to take them and what kinds of things. So my brother, my sister, they both helped me a lot. And I so appreciate my brother and my sister in my life. So did you know that the church is a family? Did you know that we are family? If you're a believer in Jesus, if you have committed your life to Jesus Christ, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And you know, you can pick your friends, but you're stuck with your family. So you're stuck with me. But um, we are a family. And did you know that God... Uh, you know, God wants us to be a tight-knit group. He wants us to be a group that loves each other, that looks out for each other. And did you also know that how we act towards one another has a big effect on the non-Christians in the world that are watching us? Because believe you me, they are watching us. And they are taking note. And they are saying, I don't know, are those Christians really loving or not? You know, do I want to be one of them or not? And so there's a lot at stake here of how we treat one another. We're in 1 Peter chapter 1. And the first point I'm going to tell you today is as Christians, we are supposed to be different. How many of you know that as Christians, we are supposed to be different from the rest of the world? And we're supposed to stand out. That's something that we're going to, we're going to tease out more next week. Um, but in 1 Peter chapter 1, starting at verse 14, it says, As obedient children... Do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Now, we'll get more into holy later, but holy just basically means be different. Stand out, be different. And then he says, since you, verse 17, since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, Live out your time as what? What does your Bible say? Strangers? Foreigners? I have foreigners. Yeah, it might say strangers. Live your lives out here as strangers or foreigners here in reverent fear. And what that's talking about is uh, our citizenship, if you are a Christian, our citizenship is not this world. This is not where we claim. Instead, our citizenship is in, do you know where? In heaven. That's right. And so that's why it calls us foreigners here. This world is not our home. If you know that's true, say amen. amen. This world is not our home. And so he says, as strangers, I need you to live different kinds of lives out among the world. And, and one of the key ways that we are supposed to stand out as Christians is how much we love each other. How much we love each other. The Bible talks about it over and over and over again. As brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to love each other. So let's read chapter 1, verse 22, where it says, Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply, what's it say next? From the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures how long? Forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Therefore, now that he's laid all that down, he says, therefore, 
rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. We need to love one another. If you're taking notes, and I really encourage you to take notes, you got a place on the back of your program there, to a little section there that's open to take notes. The first point is this. Being a Christian means having sincere love for one another. Sincere love. Uh, that word brotherly love actually comes from the Bible. The, the original, the New Testament was written in Greek, and the word in Greek is philos, which means love. And Adelphoi, which means brothers. If you put it together, you get brotherly love. Hey, there's a city in America that's called the city of brotherly love. Yeah, Philadelphia. That's why it's called that, because that's what its word, its name means. Brotherly love. Phila, philos and Adelphoi. We are supposed to practice brotherly love. I am so thankful for a brother, an older brother, who looked out for me when I was a kid uh, we used to ride the bus together, my brother, before he got too cool for school and decided he wanted to drive, and he didn't want to ride the bus anymore. But when he still rode the bus, there was this kid, this older kid about my brother's age that was picking on me and my best friend Andy, and, and his name was Ronnie Litka. And my brother said the reason he picked on and bullied younger people is because he knew he couldn't handle kids his own age. And so he picked on younger kids, right? Uh, so he was picking on me and Andy, and my brother stood up for me and said, hey, leave them alone. You leave them alone. And Ronnie, you know, started mouthing off, oh, you want a piece of me? You want to, you want to go? Blah, blah, blah. When we get off the bus, we're going to go, right? <laughs> and so they got off the bus, and Ronnie started mouthing off again, blah, 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 you want a piece of me? Now, he said, my brother said he didn't actually, it didn't turn into a fight. But he said, I was ready if it did. My brother was ready to fight on my behalf, right? Isn't that cool to have an older sibling that looks out for you, doesn't let you get picked on, because he loves me. So it says we need to have sincere love. Now, the word in Greek for sincere literally means unhypocritical. We all know what hypocrite means, right? Two-faced, playing like one thing, but you're really another. Unhypocritical love. Not fake love, real, sincere, genuine love. Genuine love for our brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, not paying lip service. You know what that means, right? Like Jesus called out some, some religious leaders. He says, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And what does that mean? That means they can put on a good show. They can seem real religious, right? Oh, wow, those people are really religious. But God knows their hearts and says, no, their hearts are actually far from me, right? We can pretend to love our brothers and sisters in Christ, we can put on a good show, put on a good front, but our hearts not really be in it. And so Peter's writing to us saying, no, we want you to have sincere love for the brothers, not hypocritical love, sincere love. And by the way, some of us may struggle with this from time to time, right? Like sometimes people do things to us that upset us. You know, they stepped on our toes. They made us feel a certain way. And it's like, you know what, Lord, I really don't feel very loving towards that person right now. In fact, I'm pretty upset with them. Right. And so you may have to pray and say, God, help my heart, because right now I don't want to have a fake kind of love. I want to love them truly from the heart. So please help me. Help me get over this. I want to love this person from the heart. All right. Second point, if you're taking notes, being a Christian means stripping off things that destroy brotherly love. Things that destroy the love that we're supposed to have for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to strip those things off. So our version that we read in the New, New International Version, it says, rid yourselves, rid yourselves of these things. But it literally, in the original language, it was like strip off these things like you would take off dirty clothes at the end of the day, right? You've been out working all day, got, got clothes all dirty, and you strip off those nasty clothes at the end of the day. It's, it's strip off these things that would destroy the unity of the family of God. And so here's the different things. He says, first of all, let's strip off deceitfulness or trickery. Deceitfulness. Deceitfulness. I'm trying to deceive you right now that I have a mustache. Excuse me, I must ask you a question. 
We don't need to deceive one another, right? Don't go around trying to trick people. You ever have a brother or a sister of yours at home, you know, trick you in when they made, like maybe they made a trade with you and they're like, hey, I'll trade you this if you give me that. Knowing good and well, they come out way better. And it's like, they, you tricked me. You tricked me. You took something good for me. You trickster, you, right? We, we shouldn't be tricking each other. We shouldn't be deceiving each other. And how many of you know that people sometimes can go around with hidden motives, right? They have these hidden motives that they're, and they try to push these hidden agendas on other people, right? They're trying to be deceptive, trying to be tricky. Uh, sometimes we put on a, a face like everything's okay, like I'm okay with you when really you're not. You walk around like everything's fine between us, but it's really not. The Bible says that's actually deception. You're deceiving that person into thinking everything's good when it's really not. And we don't need to do that. Instead, what does the Bible say? In Ephesians uh, chapter 4, do we have this on screen? There we go. Therefore, each of you must put off what? Falsehood. And instead speak truthfully to your neighbor. That's talking about us. For we are all members of one body. That's talking about the body of Christ. Within the body of Christ, speak truthfully. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. So what's it saying? If you've got stuff built up, you've got anger, you've got, you're upset, and it's built up, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to take care of it. We're supposed to get it out there, and don't let it build up. Don't, don't you know, the same day, if you can, it says, you know, before the sun goes down. But definitely it means sooner rather than later. Right? Maybe it doesn't literally, maybe the Bible doesn't literally mean that day before the sun, but it does mean sooner than later. Because what happens when we let things fester inside of us and grow, it turns into like a cancer. You know how like a cancer grows and it gets out of control and all of a sudden we've got this relationship cancer between me and that other person. Right? We don't need to let that stuff grow and fester out of control and become a cancer in our relationship. Amen? we got, we got to get it out there. we got to speak truthfully. Hey, when you said that thing... That really hurt my feelings, and can we talk about this, you know, and, uh, you know, get some resolution. Um, all right, let's talk about the next one, hypocrisy, hypocrisy. So in the New Testament, in Jesus' time, they actually had these things. They got the word hypocrite from these actors in plays. It, it literally is like a play actor, right? And in plays, what do you do? You put on a mask. You put on a mask. And you have the, you know, you've seen that, the happy mask when they're playing and when they're happy. And then they change, change out and put on a sad mask when they're sad, right? They're actors. And so what is he saying? He's saying, take off the mask. Quit being an actor. Quit, quit playing here, right? Quit playing. Take off the hypocrisy. Um, there, was a, there was a youth minister at my dad's church when he was the pastor. And he came in and, and he made he talked a good talk like he was really, oh, Rick, I really support you, man. I'm your, I'm your right-hand man and I'm going to support you. Meanwhile, you know what he was doing? He was going behind my dad's back talking to the elders and sowing seeds of poison against my dad of why they should fire him and hire this guy, right? That's, that's hypocrisy, isn't it? It's, it's acting one way but being another way. That's being hypocritical. Take off the mask. By the way, there's a difference between someone who's really trying to live for God, but they just make mistakes, right? That's, that's not hypocritical. You're really trying to live for God, but you just mess up sometimes. Versus someone who they know in their heart they're not really trying to live for God. They're just putting on a show, right? There is a difference. So hopefully we all are trying to be the people who really are trying to live for God. And we just mess up sometimes. You know, I didn't mean, I really didn't mean to hurt that person like that. You know, I didn't really mean to say that. That's, it slipped out. I didn't, I didn't want to hurt that person, right? I messed up. Please forgive me. Um, all right, envy. What are we going to use for envy? How about some sunglasses? Because why? Because we envy what we see, right? We need to take off envy. We need to get that out of our lives because envy is going to destroy the love of God and the unity of God's family. Uh, within the body of Christ. We need to take off that envy. Guys, can't we just be happy for other people's successes? Mm -hmm. Like, why do we have to be jealous? Be like, oh, man, they got that. Why, oh, they, they were able to accomplish that. Don't be jealous. Be happy for them. Yeah. Let's be happy. Let's celebrate the successes of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Right? Uh, and did you know envy actually is one of the causes that leads to fighting 
among brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, our brother James that we're going to meet someday from 2,000 years ago. We're going to see him in heaven. I love his letter. I love the letter of the book of James. It's one of my favorite books. And he talks about this um, in chapter 4 where envy causes fights. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. Right? And so what does he say it starts with? Envy, covetousness. We, we see something, we see it, and we want it. And so all of a sudden, I got to have it. And I'm going to take it from that person. I'm going to steal. I'm going to kill. I'm going to do whatever because I got to have it. It all starts with the eyes. Envy. And that can destroy our, our Christian fellowship. All right. What else do we need to strip off? We need to strip off gossip and slander. And so I'm putting on some chapstick. And what does it say? We got to take off those things. We got to take off those things that cause division. So I'm going to I'm going to take off the chapstick, right? Take off gossip and slander because we use our lips to gossip and slander. See what I did there? Get it? I, I, I thought about using lipstick and then taping, taking it off, and I thought, no, that'll cause rumors. That'll cause gossip. <laughs> we don't want to do that. So, <laughs> uh, all right, let's get back on the gossip. We don't. We we got to get off the gossip. Um, so there were three, three pastors that were at a retreat, uh, at a pastor's retreat. And it's rare that pastors just get to fellowship with other pastors, right? And, and so they're in a boat. They're fishing. And, and one of the pastors says, hey, since it's just us pastors here in this boat, why don't we just share some secret sins? Because we know none of us will tell you know, anybody else, right? We, we trust each other as pastors. Yeah. He says, I'll start. My secret sin is gambling. When I go out of town, it's cha-ching, cha-ching, let the machines ring, right? So the second guy is like, well, my secret sin is laziness. He said, guys, I, I, don't, I haven't written my own sermon myself in years. I just go on the Internet. I just steal other people's sermons. That's, that's bad. I don't do that, by the way. I write my own stuff right here. This is my stuff. <laughs> um, the third one said, well, my secret sin is gossip, and man, I can't wait to get out of this boat. <laughs> Be careful who you tell stuff to, right? You may want to ask them, is their secret sin gossip? <laughs> um, but gossip is dangerous, right? We talk bad about others, spreading rumors that we don't really know is true. You ever play that game Telephone? Remember Telephone? You tell a secret to one person, then they pass it on to another person. And you get ten people later, and the story has totally changed. Right? What does that tell you? We are not good at passing on the truth. Right? It's going to get messed up. And so don't pass on false rumors you don't know is true. It's just going to turn it worse and worse. And pretty soon this person's a murderer. And, you know, they're going to jail. It's like, what? <laughs> Where did that come from? No. Uh, it's dangerous. It's dangerous. It destroys Christian fellowship. Uh, one time I was at a week of church camp. And uh, this, the guy who was in charge of the week of church camp, for whatever reason, every year he had this tradition of getting us up early on Monday morning at like 6 in the morning and says, we're going to have a morning, Monday morning early worship service to God, right? I am not a morning person. 6 is a bad number to me, right? Like I do not like 6. I really don't like anything earlier than that. So we get up at 6. We're all kind of dragging, right? And like, okay, we're going to go. And we have a worship service. He led us in some songs. And then, and then he opened it up to the adults. And he said, hey, do you have anything, adults, that you want to share with the group? And some people kind of popcorn style shared different things. And uh, me, I spoke up. I said, I, I said, guys, I'll be honest with you. I really didn't want to get up at 6 in the morning. When he told us we were doing that, I was not happy. I did not like to get up early. But I will say that since we did this worship service, God did teach me something, and here's what I learned, right? Well, this guy who was in charge of the week at camp got offended that I said that, that, like, I don't like getting up at 6 in the morning, and he felt like I made him look bad in front of everybody, right? And I could tell something was wrong. I was like, why is he? He's acting different towards me. Like, he's mad about something. So I asked him. I was like, 
hey, man, are, are we okay? Like, what's, what's going on? He said, no, you offended me. You, you made me look bad in front of everybody. And I said, well, man, I'm sorry. I, I was not trying to make you look bad. I'm just not a morning person. So I apologize. I want things to be good between us. I said, I'll tell you what. I, I'm even going to go apologize to the other staff that are working the camp. And I did. I said, hey, guys, I said something kind of negative towards this guy. And I apologized to him. Like, don't want you thinking bad about him, okay? Let's, uh, so... Sometimes we got to do that. We just got to, let's not do gossip. Let's not make people slander, you know, and make them feel bad. Um, Proverbs 16, 28, on screen, gossip is dangerous. Gossip. Proverbs 16, 28, a perverse person, that's not a good word, by the way. A perverse person stirs up conflict, and a gossip separates close friends. What's the damage that gossip can do? It can separate close friends. Proverbs 26, 20, without wood, a fire goes out. Without gossip, a quarrel dies down. If you don't fuel that fire of, with, with gossip, it dies out, right? As charcoal to embers and as wood to fire, so is a quarrelsome person for kindling strife. The word they gossip are like choice morsels. They go down to the inmost parts. So these things, guys... One of the things that I believe Peter is trying to teach us is these kinds of things that we just went over, those are immature, right? Those are immature things to do. You know, hypocrisy and deceit and, and gossip and slander and, and, and envy, those are immature. And we don't need to be immature. When I was a kid, I did some pretty immature things to my sister. Um, so I was a year and a half older than her, and uh, she was still at that stage where she played with baby dolls. And uh, do you remember the days of leg warmers? Remember leg warmers back in the 80s and early 90s? So I took one of her baby dolls. I don't know why I thought this was a good idea. I took one of her baby dolls and I stuffed it upside inside of a leg warmer. And then I hung it up on a nail in our sun porch. And then I told my sister about it because I thought it was funny. She came out. She saw her baby doll hanging by a nail. She started crying. She ran and told my dad. My dad came out. He saw it. He was mad. He told my best friend and his brother, he said, Andy, Travis, time for you to go home. And they went, Pew! <laughs> they could tell he was not happy. I don't remember exactly what happened to me, but it wasn't good. <laughs> it wasn't good. And I never did that again. <laughs> uh, another time I was going to pretend, pretend like I was going to hit my sister on the head with a baseball bat. And I promise you I was only going to pretend. I was going to bring it right down to her head and be like, and bring it back up. And I went too far and I actually hit her on the head with a metal baseball bat and she started crying and guys hitting people with a metal baseball bat or pretending is immature hanging baby dolls up from a nail is immature things like hypocrisy and deceit and malice and envy and gossip and slander those are immature and we need to throw those things out of here right get rid of these things that cause division Hey, what's the most dysfunctional family that you can think of on TV, like TV family, okay? Or what is a show where you frequently see dysfunctional people, okay? Think about, so I, I thought, did you think of any? Somebody said Archie Bunker. <laughs> you remember Archie Bunker? Yeah. Uh, how many of you remember the show Roseanne when it came out? So the thing about Roseanne was every family, every TV family before them was like this picture-perfect family, right? Like nothing ever went wrong, or if it did, it was some silly little thing, and it was always resolved in 30 minutes, right? Every problem got resolved in 30 minutes. But Roseanne, they just came out messed up. They, they were like not trying to be the picture-perfect family. They were real, and they, were, they had some dysfunction. Jerry Springer Show. Oh, my goodness, there's some dysfunctional people on that show. Agree? So, guys, here's the thing. When the church, when brothers and sisters in Christ act like the Jerry Springer show, we get disrespected and we drag God's name through the mud. But when we practice love and unity, other people are attracted to God's family and God's name is made famous. Amen? That's what we need to be after is that love and unity and trying to make God's name famous. Immature people talk about others behind their back. Mature people go straight to the person that they have a problem with. Mature people are able to accept constructive criticism. Immature people always want to blame others. <clears throat> Mature people are able to admit their mistakes and ask for forgiveness. 
being part of a dysfunctional family, that's the pits. But being part of a healthy Christian family, that's a cool place to be. And that's where we want to be. And so the last point is this. Being a Christian family means we have a love that is out of this world. A love that the world has never seen. <clears throat> when a Christian family acts like it's supposed to, things go a lot smoother. And not only that, but people see it and they go, I want to be a part of that because that's great. That's a good thing. Right? But we must show a different kind of love than what the rest of the world is doing. Right? They have to see something different. John chapter 17, Jesus was praying, and he said, My prayer is not for them alone, talking about his disciples. He says, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That's us. Jesus was praying for us in the future, right? Those who would believe in me through their message, that all of them may be what? One. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. What is he saying? He's saying when we are one, when we are acting as a unified body of believers, the world is going to believe in Jesus. That should be our goal. In order for that to happen, they're going to have to see a love that is out of this world, something that is way different than what they're seeing now. Back in 1998, Dateline NBC ran this attention-getting story of a woman who did something for another woman that probably most people would not do. So they were both part of the same church. They weren't really friends, but they were part of the same church. And they were doing, uh, their church was doing a 40-day of fasting and prayer. And they were both trying to seek God's will for their life. Well, the one woman just felt very strongly through this prayer that she needed to donate her kidney to this woman who was on the prayer list for needing a kidney. Like I said, never really friends, just I, she knew of it, she prayed, and that's what God wants me to do. And so she did. And people couldn't understand why. After all, they weren't family. They weren't even friends before that. One was white and the other lady was black. Her response was simply, she has a need and God has given me the ability to meet that need. That's what loving each other is all about. I love it when non-believers, non-Christians see Christian love and they're just blown away by it. Uh, the early Christians had this kind of love and it caught the attention of an historian. There was a Greek non-believing historian named Lucian. And he said, after observing the warm fellowship of Christians, he said, it is incredible to see the fervor with which the people of that religion help each other in their wants. They spare nothing. Their first legislator, talking about Jesus, has put it in their heads that they are family. <laughs> they believe, they really believe they are family, and they act like it. One more story. After the USS Pueblo was captured by the North Koreans, the 82 surviving crew members were taken into captivity, and 13 of these uh, American soldiers were taken into a room every day where they were made to sit very rigidly in a really rigid bad position for for hours they had to sit like this and uh, uh, one of the North Korean guards would come in and he just come to the first person who was sitting around the table and he would just beat the guy with the butt of his rifle just beat him senseless until he passed out the next day same guard comes in picks the first person who was sitting there the same guy again beats him down till he passes out senseless well they started thinking about it and they're like Guys, if we don't do something, this guy is going to get killed, right? And so one of them volunteered and, and took his place and sat in that first chair. And so when the Korean guard came in, he beat that guy with his rifle, right? The next, guy, next day, another guy took that first spot. The next day, another guy, a different person, took that spot. And, and they did that for weeks until they finally gave up. The guards finally gave up and realized they could not beat out of them that kind of sacrificial and that's the kind of love that we need to be showing our Christian family, our brothers and sisters in Christ. Guys, what would happen if the church really believed that we were family? What would it look like if we really served each other with a sacrificial love? Well, Jesus said the world would believe and the world would be transformed. 
And so let us throw off anything that destroys Christian unity and Christian fellowship. Let us throw off hypocrisy. Let us throw off deceit. Let us throw off envy. Let us throw off gossip and slander. And let us take on a Jesus mindset. Let's throw off. Let's throw off the spirit of division and instead take on a spirit of unity. Let's throw off our personal preferences of how we like and this and that, and, and let's instead take on a mindset of being one, trying to reach the lost for Jesus Christ. Amen. Guys, may the world see our unity, how we work together. May the world see our love, how we sacrifice for one another. May the world see we care, how we serve the community together. May the family of God grow, and may God get the glory.